Welcome and thank you for joining us this afternoon for Raising Money Savvy Children, Embracing Your Role as Chief Financial Parent. My name is Kathy Chern and I am a Consumer Health Librarian at East Brunswick Public Library. Today's program is brought to you by the Libraries Just for the Health of It initiative to promote community health and wellness. Our speaker today is Bradley Basker, Financial Advisor at Morgan Stanley in Boston. Bradley works with clients to help build a sustainable financial plan to achieve their financial and life goals and manage their assets for them. He is licensed in New Jersey, New York, Massachusetts, Connecticut, Florida, and Texas. Bradley has already delivered free webinars focused on financial wellness and literacy to companies, synagogues, schools, alumni networks, and public libraries, and enjoys giving back to his communities in this way. Please be aware that this talk is being recorded. Please keep your microphones muted and your webcams off. The recording will be available at ebpl.org slash YouTube. If you have any questions, please type them into the chat box. Our speaker will answer questions at the end of the talk. And without further ado, I'll turn things over to Bradley. Thanks, Kathy, and thank you all for being here again today. For those of you that have joined the first two sessions last month, it's great to be back. This is part three of a four-part series. Coming up in two weeks, we have another session on 529 plans. But today, we're going to make you think critically whether you're a parent uh, of someone who's no longer living in your house, Perhaps you're a parent of someone that's still growing up. Perhaps you're an aspiring parent. Today, we're going to talk about some of the things that you really should be thinking about when it comes to raising money savvy children. As Kathy mentioned, my name is Bradley Basker. I'm a financial advisor at Morgan Stanley in Boston. And let's talk about why we're here today. Because as a parent, you want what's best for your children. And part of raising happy, healthy, and independent kids is helping them learn how to be money savvy. And, but talking about money is hard, especially with children. And some parents dread talking with their kids about money because they're afraid it's going to open Pandora's box. Others simply don't know how to do it or where to begin. So where do you start? We're going to break down and break the ice on the conversation by giving you a strategy for how to have what I like to call the money talk with your kids. Now, you're probably looking at me and saying, Bradley, you look extremely young. How could you give a, a seminar on raising money savvy kids? And the reality is I've only been a parent for two months. I've got a newborn daughter, but I grew up in a household where my parents, I think, raised me and my two siblings to be extremely money savvy. We talked about money growing up. I was acutely aware of how much private school costs, the college costs. My parents always used to say, you know, money doesn't grow on trees. And so I feel like I've got the perspective of the other side of how do you raise someone to be money savvy as opposed to being the parent that has done that. And so, again, I'm going to be interested during the Q&A, perhaps some of you on here can share some of your perspectives of what you've done as parents or how you, you were raised as children. But that's the perspective I'm coming at from, plus the fact that I do work with families to kind of think about how do you generate that intergenerational awareness between, you know, different generations. So today we're going to cover a number of important topics related to the money talk. First, we're going to talk about the importance and benefits of starting early, and we'll reflect on how you and your partner, if you have one, can prepare to start that dialogue. Then we'll dive into the money talk itself, and we'll discuss how to simplify this very complicated topic. Finally, we'll go over some of the resources that Morgan Stanley has that might supplement the money talk. And finally, we'll wrap up with Q&A, as Kathy said. Now, before we start, I want to acknowledge that every family is different and has different values. Our discussion today is full of suggestions for tackling this issue with your family, but I hope that you'll pick and choose what works best for you. And the reason I say that is, you know, I gave the example of my family. My wife, on the other hand, she grew up in a family where money was kind of taboo. She was insulated. She never really knew what the cost of living was, what the cost of education was, how much her family made. And so every family is different. I just want to say, I don't want to paint with broad strokes. Take what you can out of this presentation and apply it to your family situation. So as parents, we have lots of goals for our kids. We want them to be motivated workers, generous givers, informed investors, conscientious savers, smart consumers. The reality is your kids are smart and chances are they already know more about money than you think that they know, but they still need some help from you. You're not off the hook. That's because regardless of their age, kids don't often have enough context to make what they know meaningful when it comes to money. So for example, your child might know how much a Ferrari costs or how much the new Air Jordan sneakers cost, but they may not be able to relate that to the price of college tuition or the average starting salary of a recent college graduate. So giving them that real life context beyond sort of the material things that they may think they know about money. Now, as you know, money management is something that you have to think about for your entire lifetime. It's not something you can sort of think about once, 
park on the sidelines and never think about again. But by starting these conversations early, you'll be able to keep the dialogue open for the future. And you'll help you prepare your kids for a lifetime of financial success. And so I put the age 10 here as kind of the starting point. I think when you get, you know, younger than that, it's kind of tough to have serious conversations. You know, perhaps you can int introduce a, a piggy bank to a child that's less than 10 years old. But really, I think 10 is the age that I think is appropriate to start to have these types of conversations and give your children more responsibility when it comes to thinking about money. And of course, once you get past, you know, college age, the conversation does not stop. It really will continue for your lifetime for as long as you're around as a parent. Now, the money talk will allow your kids to have financial freedom in the future, which means financial freedom for you as well, right? You don't necessarily as a parent want your children to have to be relying on you for the rest of your life. You wanna sort of go off into the sunset, enjoy your retirement, and not have to worry about subsidizing your children for the rest of your life. Now, perhaps that's something you would like to do. And again, I, I wanna reiterate, not everyone has that mentality, but you kind of want to put your children in a position where they can be financially independent, which in turn will allow you to be financially independent. Now, when they have that sort of money savvy mentality, that'll give them independence. You know, no ch child wants to have to sort of tuck their tail between their legs and ask their parents in their 20s and 30s for money uh, because they can't afford something. And so when you give them sort of that, that infrastructure in place, they're going to generate that financial independence that they want for themselves. It'll also allow you to share your values and beliefs about money. So as a parent, your children are obviously very impressionable and you can kind of tell them this is how our family perceives money. This is how we perceive our finances. You know, the idea that money doesn't grow on trees or there's no such thing as a free lunch. Like those are the types of things that as a parent, you have a platform to, to really indoctrinate your kids with at a young age when they'll believe kind of anything that comes out of your mouth. It'll also provide them with opportunity. Talk to them about the fact that money, whether it's not the be all end all, does offer opportunities in life, whether it's sort of getting to the sort of uh, your dream home, being able to buy a car, going to the college of your dreams, right? It does provide opportunity whether you like it or not. And then finally, choices. The idea that if you've got money and you've done things the right way, you're going to have the ability to kind of choose what path you want to take. Do you want to put the $10,000 towards a graduate degree? Do you want to put $10,000 towards a vacation? The point is, is you have the ability to make choices. Choices can be good or bad, depending on how you look at it. But in general, I would say choices are kind of something you want to give your child and you, they'll be able to have that once they start to think about, you know, being money savvy. And then finally, the money talk can empower them to make smart and informed decisions about money. You don't want them to look back on their 20s and 30s and say, man, I wish I knew what I was doing. And I, I kind of just threw money away or I had too much money sitting in a checking or savings account. If you start the conversation early and have it earlier than you even think you need to have it, you're going to set your kids up for a lot of financial success. Now, before you have the money talk, you yourself, you and your partner need to prepare a little bit. First, think about the values that you'd like your kids to develop with respect to money. Are those values aligned with your own values and behaviors when it comes to money? Or perhaps you, you sort of think one way, but if you could do it all over again, you'd perhaps prefer your kids to think and act a different way. You know, as with anything related to raising kids, it's important that there aren't discrepancies between what you say and what you do. For example, how do you walk the line between enjoying the lifestyle that you've worked so hard to achieve and teaching your children that material possessions are not the source of happiness and fulfillment? So reconciling that internally before you talk to your kids is extremely important. Now, once you have a clear picture of your own personal values, I'm talking about you yourself, then you're going to want to sit down with your partner, if you have one, and reflect on your beliefs about money. Be open, be candid, be honest with each other. Because the more successful you are in harmonizing your values about speaking before speaking to your kids about money, the more successful you'll be in managing the money talk. And so, again, I go back to, you know, my wife and I, even when we were dating, we talked about the fact that we had different perspectives on finances. You know, some people like my wife sort of cruise by, not necessarily thinking about the ramifications of spending something on this or spending some money on that. Whereas I'm always thinking about if I spend it on this, what am I foregoing in the future? So talk about your values, talk about your beliefs and make sure that you're on the same page. That doesn't mean you have to necessarily agree, but you want to present that united front to your kids. Now, think about as well your upbringing, right? Talk about perhaps any family beliefs or the way you were brought up, because that oftentimes is going to inform how you act yourself. And that might lead to some sort of entrenched beliefs that are tough to get out of you. And again, like I said, my wife and I have these conversations all the time. And a lot of what we believe tends to be how we were brought up. Now, when you align those values and beliefs, like I said, that'll allow you to present the unified front to your kids. And, you know, I, I've seen this, you know, even with, with friends of mine who've got older kids and, and just growing up, 
when one parent says one thing, another parent says another, kids are going to naturally gravitate towards the lowest common denominator, whoever makes life easier, whoever's going to, you know, give a, a bigger dollar value or something like that. And so you want to make sure that your kids don't understand or don't realize that there might be some friction behind the scenes. To your kids, you want to be united when it comes to talking about money. Also, you want to talk with your partner about how your wealth impacts your children, right? Consider any financial changes that may affect your family in the future, such as inheritances or the transfer of a family business, right? When they see perhaps a change in lifestyle or they sort of know that some money has come in the door, make sure you're aware of how you're going to approach that conversation with them. Now, as a parent, you wear lots of hats and play many different roles in your child's life. So having the money talk with your kids requires you to set a good example. And so in one facet, you can be their boss, enforcing rules and requirements, or their teacher, helping them set up a budget, right? You want to embrace all possibilities when it comes to being a parent and having the money talk. You can see on this slide, there's so many different roles you play as a parent. You can't just look at it and say, I'm going to be the boss when it comes to money. I'm going to talk down to them and say, this is how it's going to be. You've got multiple different roles that you can play when it comes to having that conversation. Now, get comfortable with the many different roles that you play. When it comes to money, what is your role? So to me, it's twofold. First, you want to help your child avoid certain behaviors and mistakes around money. Perhaps these are mistakes that you've made that you don't want your kids to face in their own lives. Think back to the mistakes you made as a teen, a 20-year-old, a 30-year-old, etc., Think about what could I have done differently? How would I want to you know, educate my kids so that they don't make the same mistakes? Or there might be general attitudes and beliefs that you don't want them to internalize. So again, think about things that perhaps you've said and that you want to correct so that you don't continue to educate your kids in that way where they sort of take on the beliefs of their parents. Because having the money talk and making it an ongoing conversation can help your child avoid things like controlling behavior, trying to buy love, using money intimidation, and putting money first. Let's give some examples of that, right? Trying to buy love, the idea that perhaps when they start dating one day, that they think they can just throw money at a partner and shower them with gifts and things like that to kind of buy their love and affection when that's really not how it works. It should be a complement to how they actually act with their partners. Now, another one is using money intimidation. There might be a situation down the line where your child perhaps makes more money than their partner and they don't, you don't want them to hold it over their partner and use money intimidation to kind of get what they want in the relationship. And then finally, putting money first, the idea that, you know, kids think money is the be all end all. If I don't have money, I'm, I'm not a good person. I'm not a successful person. I shouldn't be happy in life. You want to make sure that they understand that there's more to life than just money. The second thing is you want to help your kids learn positive behaviors towards money. So we talked about avoiding some of the pitfalls. You also want them to have positive attitudes towards money. And so you can help your child learn, you know, discipline, right? The idea that you need to understand there's a fixed pie. Not anyone, everyone is in a, a, an heir of Jeff Bezos or wins the lottery. So you've got to be disciplined because there's a finite amount of resources. Planning towards your goals, the idea that perhaps you forego short-term goals for long-term goals that perhaps are going to be a much bigger uh, a nest egg for you to get to. Healthy priorities, the idea of, again, what is important? What are my needs versus what are my wants? Separating self-worth from wealth, wealth, which again, goes back to what I was saying. The idea that just because you're not necessarily wealthy or have as much money as your best friend doesn't mean you're any less better of a person or a, a friend or a son or daughter. Charitable giving, right? The idea of talking to them about, you know, the fact that not everyone is as fortunate as us. And in, in starting at a young age to explain that helping others is something that's going to help, you know, society and make you feel better. And then finally, saving. The idea that, again, you want to put money away for another day. Perhaps you lose your job. Perhaps something you're going to have to take care of yourself or an expense is going to be higher than you expected. You want to make sure you've got saving kind of as a priority. Now, so here's an outline for how to prepare for the money talk. As we discussed, make sure you and your partner have reflected on your own experiences and are on the same page when it comes to your goals and practices around money. You and your partner both need to commit to setting a good example for your kids. In other words, you need to be ready to walk the talk because like I said, kids are going to pick up on the fact that, you know, mom or dad is saying one thing, but doing something differently. And you don't want to make sure that they do that. Now, remember, the money talk should be a conversation, not a lecture. Odds are talking with your kids rather than talking at them will be a much more effective way of getting your point across. In my experience, the single most effective way to engage your kids in the conversation is to actually ask them questions that challenge their assumptions and inspire them to search for and formulate their own answers rather than sort of saying, here's how mom or dad says it's going to be. First, ask them questions. What does money mean to you? 
You know, how, how do you feel uh, money affects our lives in some way? Ask them the questions, see the direction they go, and then obviously you're going to have the platform to give your two cents. Now, once you've done all that, you're ready for what I like to call the money talk. Now, the money talk can be split up into two parts. The mechanics of money, which deals with how money works and how it can be used, and the meaning of money, which is just as, if not more important, than the mechanics. The meaning of money focuses on the values that you'd like your kids to develop with respect to money and how they think about what money means to them and what they hope to accomplish with it. We're going to dive into each of those in more detail shortly. So first, let's talk about the mechanics of money. This part of the money talk focuses on four aspects of money, earning, saving, spending, and giving. And so let's start by diving into earning the first of the four. Chances are earning an allowance will be your child's first experience with earning and making their own decisions about money. Before the money talk, make sure you and your partner discuss things like, when will the allowance start? How much will the allowance be? Whether your child will need to do some sort of work to earn the allowance, and whether your child will be able to earn additional opportunities for an additional allowance. Now, during the money talk, explain your agreed upon allowance strategy to your child and go over the rules and requirements, including what you expect the allowance to cover. So again, if you want to put some boundaries in place, they can't spend the money on this but they can spend the money on that. You're going to want to make sure you agree to that ahead of time and you let them know that if they don't follow the rules, that allowance, that pipeline is going to stop. Now, as your kids get older, you might want to change the way that the allowance functions to reflect their increasing maturity and facility with money. An allowance, when structured thoughtfully, can teach your kids the necessity of budgeting, the need to save to fund large purchases in the future, and the necessity of making choices. Now, you might also want to talk to your children about earning money by working for others. You can begin by reflecting on the needs of your child and the needs of your community. Then, discover and describe opportunities for earning that exist outside the home, such as dog walking or babysitting. You'd be surprised how many of your kids, you know, on their iPhones know about opportunities already, are looking for ways to make money on the sideline. We talk about the gig economy, the ability to sort of make money in a digital world. There are so many ways that you know, teenagers can make money, college kids can make money in ways that were never available to the generations that preceded them. And if your child expresses an interest, encourage entrepreneurship. You know, teaming up with other kids and starting a business can be a great way to learn about money. So whether that's as simple as having a lemonade stand in the summer or starting a shoveling business with all the snow that we've been getting, like that's a great way to learn about working with other people, sharing expenses, sharing costs, things like that. Um, I think entrepreneurship is a great way for children at a young age to start to learn more about money. Now, after you've talked about earning and your child's earning potential, the next natural step is to talk about saving. So start with the concept of simply keeping something for later. I think in general, so many kids now in this sort of uh, instant gratification era that we're in, always think about sort of that next move, the immediate term. And they don't necessarily have that, that, that foresight to think about what could come in the future. All right, emphasize the importance of setting and prioritizing goals. And it may be useful to engage in a discussion about short and long-term objectives. So ask them, you know, what are you trying to get? Are you trying to buy a car when you're 17 and you get your license? Well, if so, mom and dad might help you, but you're going to have to get, you know, some of it yourself. So if you want to buy that car and you really want that, perhaps at 13, 14, you should be putting money away for that and focusing less on, you know, going out for, to go to the movies or dining with your friends or buying an extra set of sneakers that you don't necessarily need. And then finally, discuss the different types of saving, right? Talk about the power of compound interest and how saving early and often can really pay off in the long term. Talk to them about having a sort of a checking account or savings account where you keep some money on the sidelines and more of an investment account that allows you to put that money to work for them where in the future, they're going to look back and say, wow, mom and dad, I really appreciate that we put some money in now. Look how much it's grown in the future. Now, here's some of the key points to cover when you talk about saving and investing. Talk about the holdings you have in companies that your child might be familiar with. So Coca-Cola or Zoom or uh, Disney, right? Those are public companies that you could potentially be invested in. Talk to them about some of those holdings. They'll start to get a little bit more interested, perhaps start reading up on those companies. And they'll get more be more willing to look up the news about those investments and get just engaged in the family decisions when it comes to investments. Then you can explain to them how what you invest in can have an impact on the world, whether it's investing in companies that have strong corporate social responsibility, what we call like ESG companies, or investing in companies whose values align with yours. Perhaps you want to invest in companies that have a female CEO or have gender or, or racial diversity. So you can start to talk to them about how you can actually put your money in places that align with your values and beliefs. 
Now, after you've emphasized the importance of saving, you can move on to an exciting topic for any child, spending. Any conversation about spending should begin with a discussion about priorities and the difference between needs, wants, and wishes. All right, I like to talk about that in a few of my seminars because I think even as adults sometimes, we conflate what's really a want with a need. A need is paying your mortgage, paying your rent, getting groceries, you know, putting clothes on your back. A want is walking in the mall and saying, I need to have every single thing that it looks like is in the window, right? That's a want. And when people say, I need to have that, I got to have that, you want to stop them right in their tracks and say, you don't really need to have that. It's something you want to have and understand that, again, if there's that finite pie and finite amount of resources that you have, perhaps some of those wants are going to have to be put on the back burner. The next thing you want to talk to them about when it comes to spending is being a smart consumer and how spending decisions can be influenced by advertising and marketing. So again, on social media, I'm sure your children see someone like a Kim Kardashian marketing a certain makeup product or Steph Curry, the Golden State Warriors point guard, marketing a shoe and everyone's like, I got to have that shoe. You want to make sure they understand that those people are being paid to advertise, that these advertisers are looking for ways to subconsciously in influence people into making decisions that perhaps they wish they hadn't made. And so you want to just make sure they're aware of that. That doesn't mean they can't buy the, the, the retail and the merchandise that their, their most famous celebrities uh, endorse, but you want to make sure they're aware of that. The next thing is stressing the importance of a budget, right? Let them know that a budget isn't a restriction, but it's rather a plan. And planning helps build wealth and independence. The idea that you want to make sure that you're not spending more than you're bringing in. Because if you're doing that, now you're overextending and you're going to be in the negative. You're going to be overdrafting your account. You're going to be in debt. You want to make sure that you've got a budget and you know exactly what you're spending on versus what you're bringing in. One idea that I like to, I like to suggest out there, and my parents have really been helpful for this over the years, is considering making an investment in your children to help them reach an important goal. So this is about replacing your natural instinct as a parent with the incentive to earn. And what I mean by that is rather than just handing your child a car when they turn 17, your son or your daughter, a car at 17, perhaps to drive to school, maybe say to them, you know what, if, they're, if they do well with school and they're responsible enough to drive, you'll provide two thirds of the purchase price of a reasonably priced car if they earn the other third. And so the principle is simple with that. I'll make an investment in you, but first you have to make one in yourself. And so they'll sort of have skin in the game. They're not going to get this perspective of, you know, mom and dad just give me everything I want. Whenever I ask, I get it. They're going to have to put a little bit of their own sweat equity into that investment. I kind of like that mentality, you know, not just giving handouts all the time. Now, when your child's 10 years old, that's a different story. But when they're at an age where they're in high school, perhaps junior, senior, they're in college, where they truly can earn money and there are ways to do that, you want to make sure that they don't sort of take that free ride as a child. Now, because spending might emphasize the importance of material possessions, our next topic, giving, can restore that balance. An easy way to introduce your kids to the concept of giving is to involve them in your household charities from a young age. So for example, giving away their old to clothes and toys. I always like to say when it comes to that example, perhaps you say, you know, uh, you know, Jimmy, you're too small, you're too big for these clothes, you've grown out of them, we're gonna give them away. A lot of parents would just go and drop it off at, at perhaps some sort of donation uh, foundation where you could give that, those clothes somewhere, the Salvation Army, something like that. What I would say is bring your child with, have them hand over the bag to the individual who works there and watch the smile, watch the, how they feel when they get the hug and say, they, you know, that person says, thank you so much for your donation. It's really going to make a difference in the lives of children around you. Now, obviously with COVID, that's not as easy to do, but I'm sort of talking about in the future when things open up, the ability to just really get your kids involved at a young age and let them feel that warmth of doing good and what that means, you know, for their confidence. Now, as your kids get older, Help them find causes they believe in and then volunteer at local organizations together. So perhaps your child is a, is a piano prodigy, a really good basketball player. Perhaps they can give back by tutoring someone to learn piano that's inner city or, or can't afford lessons themselves. Or to give basketball or, or baseball lessons to someone that perhaps couldn't afford it themselves. Or volunteer at a food pantry, something like that, and do it with them. It's one thing to say, you know, Jimmy, you really should go and do this. It's a good thing to do. But it's another thing when a child sees their parent doing it with them. It really opens their eyes and says, okay, listen, if mom and dad are willing to do this, perhaps this is something that I should prioritize as well. The other thing you can do is discuss current events and how you as a family can help. I remember it must have been maybe 2007, 2008 when there was that big, I think it was a hurricane or an earthquake in Haiti. My parents talked to us about what was going on, the destruction that happened. And my brother in our school started a fundraiser to raise money because my parents sort of talked to him about what was going on. We weren't in the, process, in the business of reading the news all the time. We weren't so aware. Social media wasn't so big back then. 
But so when you're as a parent at dinner, talk about the things that are going on in the world and opportunities to help out, it might spark some interest in your children to help out. And then finally, teach your children how to research charitable, charitable organizations and how to gauge their success and measure their impact. Again, most of your children probably know how to use Google pretty well, know how to use in, the internet to help them sort of look into different uh, 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 websites that talk about different charities and perhaps ones that you know, might be more uh, aligned with what they're interested in. Now, in a perfect world, that's the end of the story, earning, saving, spending, and giving, the mechanics of the money talk. But really, there's one big wild card. And that I can't emphasize enough is the concept of borrowing. Because borrowing right now is a huge issue in this country. Debt has never been higher, whether it's student loan debt, credit card debt, auto loan debt, et cetera. And while you don't want to encourage your kids to take out loans, sorry, while you don't want to encourage your kids to take out loans and get credit cards at too young an age, it's important to expose them to the concepts of credit. Because today, 40% of Americans are in debt in some form or fashion. And you want your kids to avoid running into this kind of money trouble, especially early in their lives. It's so hard to get out from a mountain of debt, especially when you're young and you're trying to accumulate wealth just out of college. You're trying to you know, put that paycheck to work and instead you're paying off debt. It can really compound on itself and create an, a domino effect. So talk about the different types of borrowing, or I talk about the, the good kind of debt versus the bad kind of debt and how to develop a positive credit score. Generally, we think of good debt as debt that helps you generate income, whether in the short term or the long term, and helps increase your net worth. So examples of good debt would be things like education or small business ownership and investing, right? The idea that I don't think it's a bad idea to take out student loan debt. If you really think going to the school of your dreams is going to set you up for a, a long career and an illustrious career, that's a good kind of debt, as long as you're aware of the cost. Bad debt typically refers to debt that you use to fund your lifestyle, things like car loans or credit card debt, where perhaps you can easily overextend yourself because sometimes it's just a matter of swiping your credit card. You never have to think about it. I think it's so easy right now to get buried in debt because you don't have to hand over cash like you used to back in the day. You never actually see the impact of that credit card swipe until it's too late, and now you're paying off huge balances and accruing interest. And so go over examples of borrowing with your kids so they can make more informed decisions in the future and understand the trade-off that if they do borrow, they do extend, they don't pay their credit card bills on time, that's going to start to accumulate interest, which can compound over time. Now that covers the mechanics of money, but what about the meaning of money, which I said is just as, if not more important than the mechanics of money. Now talking about what money means to you as a family is just as important as talking about what you can do with your money. And so here are some questions that you can discuss as a family. And again, some of these questions might not be appropriate for your situation. Perhaps these are conversations that you have individually with your kids or you'd have over dinner with multiple kids if you have multiple kids. And so conversations that focus on questions like these are more about just dollars. They're about guiding values and precepts. Your answers to these questions will help reveal what is important to you, who you are as a family, and what you hope to accomplish with your wealth. So again, I would say, it's appropriate for you to share your answers to these questions, but I would say start out asking your children what their answers would be to some of these questions, right? Why do we value money? What does it mean to be rich? What do we want to accomplish with it? See what they have to say and then add in your two cents and, and start to steer the conversation in the direction that is kind of the, the direction you want to have your family go in. Now, if you remember one thing from the seminar, I hope it's this. The money talk isn't something that you do just once and you say, okay, I've, I've done my job as a parent, that's it, never have to broach it again. Conversations about the purpose, meaning, and significance of wealth are the kinds of conversations that we need to have with our kids for the rest of our lives. I can't tell you, you know, I thought when I got out of college, like I'm on my own, I'm making a salary, I'm not living with my parents anymore. But yet here I am, I'm 29 years old, I'm still talking to my parents about financial decisions of my, you know, my life, whether it's for me personally, for me and my wife, for me and my family for the short term, for the long term. And so you, if you're someone that wants to be involved in your kid's financial future, that's not going anywhere. And I'd encourage you to be proactive about having conversations with your kids and not being in the dark because oftentimes, you know, kids might be too embarrassed to say, you know, mom and dad, I'm struggling. And if you kind of open the subject up to them, you might find that they'll be more candid with you. And so what we've done today is given you a way to jumpstart that conversation with, about money with your kids, but it's important to keep that dialogue going and going. Now, here are just a few ideas for how you might sort of keep talking with your kids about money. And Morgan Stanley has some really great resources available. So 
So we've partnered with EverFi to offer something called Financially Fit, which is a series of age-appropriate digital financial learning programs. And Financially Fit can help members of your family from childhood through adulthood become financially responsible and take control of their financial futures. For more practical tips, uh, you can reach out to me about something we call Opening Pandora's Box, which is a brochure we've created to help make the process of talking to your kids about money much, much easier. This publication is geared exactly towards parents like you, and I'd be happy to share that if you reach out to me directly. And then finally, we have something called Table Topics, which is a set of cards that you can print out. And it's a, a, another tool for starting conversations with your family or keeping the dialogue going. It's great for dinner time or long road trips. Uh, anytime you can sort of find the time to have a conversation about these types of things, you could use these table topics. So again, some of the questions is, do you think it's better to save, spend, or give? Uh, how do you decide the appropriate amount of an allowance? That's sort of a question you perhaps talk about with just your partner. Uh, what was the most important thing someone taught you about money? Maybe that's the question you ask your child when they're in college. You say, looking back, what is, so how, how did we do things right? How did we do things not so well? And so those are kind of ways that you can start to have that conversation. Morgan Stanley really has talked about the emphasis of families getting in the mix when it comes to talking about money, not just relying on the parents. Because again, soon enough, your children are going to be grown up. They're going to be financially independent, I hope. And they're going to be in the same position as you are as parents. You want to make sure that this, the sort of the string of events, you know, is in the right direction, not something that you look back and say, man, I, I really wish I'd talked to my kids about this earlier than I did. So that's the end of our conversation here today. A little bit of a shorter topic than the last two. I think the one we have coming up in two weeks time, which is all about 529 college savings plans, uh, simply the smart way to save for college. This is really geared to future parents, current parents, grandparents who are looking to perhaps help their kids or their grandkids out with going to college. As you'll learn, it's actually not just used for college. It can also be used K through 12. It could also be used for graduate school. We'll talk a lot more about it. I personally think 529 plans are the most underutilized but most advantageous tax saving vehicle that's out there. And I really feel very strongly about a 529 plan. I just opened one up for my daughter. We'll talk more about that coming up in two weeks. If you'd like to reach out to me further uh, to have a conversation or have a consultation of any kind, complimentary, uh, feel free to reach, uh, reach out to me. You can find me on Google. Just Google my name, Bradley Basker Morgan Stanley. You can take down my email, bradley.baskermorganstanley.com. You have my phone number. You can follow me on social media. It's not hard to find me. And Kathy will send out my contact information in the follow-up, which will include a flyer from today's session, just recapping everything we talked about. Again, I appreciate you all being here today. Hopefully this has been informative and I wanna open the floor back up to Kathy to facilitate a Q and A. Okay, great. Thanks a lot, Bradley. So if you have any questions, please type them into the chat box. And while we're waiting for some questions, here's what I'll say, you know, if anyone wants to volunteer how they've done it as a parent, as a grandparent, you know, I'm, I'm looking for advice myself. I'm not an expert when it comes to parenting. I'd love to hear some perspectives of what you've done with your family to uh, have the money talk and raise money to have kids as well. Hopefully this is thought provoking and you know, this is something that if hopefully people can take some tidbits away, integrate it into their situation and perhaps come talk to me in a couple months time and tell me what worked and what didn't work. Okay, so um, someone said what they did was they encouraged their teenager to start a business using her hobby. That's great. Yeah, I, I think forcing teenagers especially to do something that they don't want to do or don't like doing is a recipe for them not doing it long-term. But when you get them to do something and they can make money doing something that they're passionate about, I think that's great. You know, I, I loved playing tennis. And so I ended up starting my own little business one summer coaching tennis privately. And it allowed me to essentially make money doing something I loved. It seemed like a no brainer. So absolutely, if you can find something your child's interested in, whether it's playing music, playing sports, anything else, playing chess, video game, whatever it is, if they can start a business doing something that they love, that's a great recipe for them sticking to it over the long term. Okay, and then another question. Can you start Roth IRAs for children? Yeah, good question. Unfortunately, you cannot. Um, they have to be at least 18 years old. And really, the whole idea with Roth IRAs, it needs to be based off of sort of the, the fact that someone has made income. And that's why you're allowed to use it for spouses, even if the spouse doesn't work. But you cannot do Roth IRAs for children. Now, what you can do is open a custodial account for your children where the money is in your name and their name as the, uh, as the, as the uh, child, but they, they won't have the ability to touch that money until they reach the age of majority, which would be 18 or 21, depending on what, what state they live in. 
Okay, and then is there a way to research to see the differences of 529 plans for each state? Yeah, uh, there is, there's a great website called savingforcollege.com. I'd highly recommend it. I've honestly used that as a source of my education on 529 plans. I would also say, please join us in two weeks time. We're gonna dive into a lot of differences. Uh, a big difference state to state is gonna be the state income tax benefits you get when you open a plan in the state that you live in. I think New Jersey, if I'm not mistaken, doesn't actually have state income tax benefits. So you actually have the ability to pick a 529 plan in any state because your state itself doesn't offer uh, you know, the best tax benefit. And as a result, things you're gonna wanna look for are which state plans have had the best investment performance over time. Because at the end of the day, 529 plan, it gets invested in mutual funds. The idea is you want that to grow as much as possible. So you're gonna wanna invest in a plan that has had good success. So again, I'd say reach out to me if you'd like. We can talk about some of the plans that have done better over time. I opened a New York plan, even though I live in Massachusetts, because the New York investment performance is extremely good over time. There's a chance I might move to New York at some point, and there's a pretty good state income tax benefit. And in Massachusetts, the deduction is only up to $2,000 of contributions from your state income tax. So it wasn't that sizable. I, I ended up opting for a 529 plan that had better investment performance over time. Okay, so another question, what do you think of a UTMA account instead of a 529 plan? Yeah, so yeah, I, I, I think it says for like uniform transfer minor account, something like that. Yeah, so Ugmar Utma. So that's what I was saying. That's kind of that custodial account. What I would say is it's a tough call, right? Because when you put your money in a 529 plan, if your child ends up not going to college or not using all the funds and you take the money out, and we'll talk more about this in two weeks' time, right? There is a, there can be a penalty. Uh, again, I don't want to get into too much detail. The difference is with the UPMA account for the person who asked is any gains on the account are going to be taxable. Whereas in a 529 plan, let's say you put $50,000 in over time and that grows to be $200,000 over the long term. That $150,000 gain would be shielded from any taxes. Whereas in an UPMA account, you don't have that ability to shield the, the, the gains from taxes. And so you actually would be able to keep more of your money in a 529 plan than an UPMA. Now, if you're just looking to save for the future for college and other things as well, then maybe an UPMA makes sense. But I think you can have both. An UPMA you create sort of so your kids have some sort of uh, some money when they when they you know reach the age of majority, and the 529 plan you open for that tax shield that you get if you intend to pay in some part for your kid's college. And then going back to the Roth IRA question, um, this person wanted to know if you could have a Roth IRA for a spouse who is unemployed. Yes, great question. So how it works is as long as you have, you're allowed to essentially open, let's just talk for the person who's employed, you're allowed to put in up to $6,000, assuming you make more than $6,000. If you make more, another $6,000, so essentially if you make $12,000 or more, you can open an, an Roth IRA for yourself and your spouse. It's called a, spice, a spousal IRA. No problem. It's just if, if you were making only $6,000, you would not be able to. But the spouse does not have to be working to open a Roth IRA to answer your question directly. It's just as a matter of uh, as long as you, the employed person, are making more than $12,000, you both can have a Roth. And just for people, I, I know we're talking about Roth IRAs. I don't want to presume that everyone knows what that is. It's a retirement account. An IRA stands for individual retirement account. And the idea is rather than like a 401k where everything is pre-taxed and when you take it out in retirement, it's going to get taxed. A Roth IRA has already been taxed the contributions. Everything that goes in, assuming you take it out after you're 59 and a half years old, any gains on the account are completely tax sheltered and tax free. So again, if 50,000 goes in over a 30 year period and it grows to 150,000, that $100,000, even when you take it out would not be taxed. And that's the benefit of a Roth IRA is the fact that it's tax free at retirement. And then can you contribute to a traditional IRA with after-tax money? You can, you can. And that's, that's the thing. So with a Roth IRA, there's an income cap. If you make too much money, you can't put your money in a Roth IRA. So some people do put their money in a traditional IRA. You just don't get the deductibility in a traditional IRA uh, if you use post-tax money. But you absolutely can do that. And that's what a lot of my clients do who make too much money. Uh, and they've already maxed out their 401k. They make too much money for the Roth IRA, they'll put their money in a traditional IRA. Keep in mind the max is $6,000 every year for each person up until you're age 50. Once you're age 50, you can put an additional $1,000. It's called a catch-up provision. You can put up to $7,000 a year in a traditional IRA.
Okay, so I think that's it for questions. Um, so thank you, Bradley, for taking the time to present on this topic and to answer all our questions. And the next talk in the series is the 529 College Savings Plan, Simply the Smart Way to Save for College on Friday, February 26th at 12 p.m. noon. So we hope to see you there. Also next week, the library will be holding a talk with a doctor from the Institute for Health, Healthcare Policy and Aging Research at Rutgers University. And that's called Let's Talk About Vaccines. The talk will take place Friday, February 19th at 12 p.m. noon. And for more information on this program or to register, you can check the library's events page at ebpl.org slash calendar. So thank you again for joining us and take care and stay safe. Thank you. Bye-bye.